So my name is Dmitry Polyakovsky, and I'm going to talk about using Redis, and I'm going to share some practical lessons from scaling real-world applications that I built. I'm going to talk about caching, running background jobs using Redis as a queue, storing data in Redis permanently, it is a database, and also keeping it in sync between Redis and other databases in your system. I am, like I said, my name is Dmitry Polyakovsky. If you guys want to follow me on Twitter, that's fine. And I work in Seattle at a company called SnapRaise. We do online fundraising for high schools and colleges. And I'm also a co-organizer of Seattle Writers Meetup. If any of you in Seattle, we have a couple events coming up, check it out. And if any of you happen to go to San Francisco, there's a Writers Conf happening at the end of the month. And I happen to have a free conference pass code, so hit me up after the talk. I can't give you a free airplane ticket, but I can get you into the conference. <laughs> like, I, I went last year, it was pretty awesome. I got a chance to hang out with a guy who created Redis and ask him some questions. So first, quick survey. How many people have used Redis? How many people have at least one year of Redis experience? Two plus? Three? Okay, well, let's, serve, let's have, actually answer the question. What is Redis? So Redis is a, not a, part of the NoSQL family of databases. And in particular, it's, like, it's called key value store or key data structure store. So have people used memcache? OK, so you have a key and a string, right? And there's some limitations about memcache, and there's some advantages of it. For example, it's big thing, multi-threaded versus single-threaded. Memcache is multi-threaded, Redis is not. Another big difference is snapshotting data to disk. If your memcache crashes, you lose your data. If Redis crashes, it can be configured to snapshot data to disk every 300 milliseconds by default. So when you restart it, it'll read everything from its local file, and it won't have to query a master database getting the data out of it. So these are some basics. As I mentioned, I work in online fundraising. And fundraising is not very exciting. But football, it's much more exciting. How many people, how many people are football fans? Well, actually, I'm not myself a football fan. But my son, who was here earlier, is a big football fan. And to show him what I actually do at work, he and I built this website together. And I used free Heroku, Mongo Lab, and Redis Cloud offerings. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off this background process. And it's going to create 32 concurrent games. So all the teams are playing each other at the same time. And every second somebody scores. So it's a very fast moving season. You can see things are changing pretty quickly. Teams are moving up and down. And if you were to use a relational database to query for this data, you'd have to spend a little bit more money on Heroku. And I don't want to. So how can we use Redis to speed things up and do it in a cost effective and also time effective manner? So behind this application, there are pretty simple models. We have divisions with many teams. Teams have many games, and games have many scores. There's also a concept of away team and home team, and there's a concept of a type of score. So field goal is three points, touchdown is six. And it obviously affects basic calculations, like how many points a team scored in a game. Let's talk about caching again. We want to use caching to make that website really fast. Really, really fast. That's what caching is about. You know, they say there are two hard things in software. And I think number two is naming things. And number one is cache and validation. Am I right? OK. So I'm going to use examples from Ruby on Rails framework in my talk. Out of pure curiosity, are people familiar with Ruby on Rails? OK, so the examples are fairly abstract and other languages and frameworks have very similar approaches. So to configure caching, you basically go into a production configuration file and you say, I want to use Redis store as my cache store. You define your Redis connection string for the server, database, port, and you can also specify namespace. And the interesting thing about Redis is it has 16 databases that are numbered 0 through 15. And you can store different types of records in the same database. You just prefix them with a namespace. And I like to put my cache in cache namespace 
And I also like to put my cache in a separate database because sometimes I have to flash my cache. And it's a lot easier to just flash DB, which will flash the entire database and not have to worry about accidentally deleting data that I do care about. Should have started a little bit late, I guess, after lunch. <laughs> anyway, so ba the very premises of caching is you have a concept of cache key and content you associate with that key. And once you create this, you don't change it. So another approach is basically you have to create some kind of an observer or a callback that when data in your application changes, you have to then fire a piece of code that will appropriately bust the cache or regenerate it. And it's more complex. This approach, you create the cache key, you create content, you store it. And you get rid of it using Redis TTL. Are people familiar with Redis TTL, how you can basically store a key and say, hold, hold on to it for the next hour, day, week, year, and Redis will just get rid of it on its own. So that's the principle of caching, is you have first cache key where you use the object, so like a user or article, that's the class name. Then you have the ID, you know, primary key. And then you have the timestamp when the that record was last updated. And that becomes your cache key. And the next time that record is updated with a new timestamp, that's the new key, key. With potentially new content or potentially not. So this approach can be a little RAM wasteful, but it's much simpler to code. So here's an example. We have a team, and the team will have a method called total points. To calculate this data, we have to go into the database. We have to go to a scores table. We have to query for a particular team ID. We have to then loop through all those scores and say, hey, you're a field goal, that's three points. You're a touchdown, that's six points. We have to sum it up and return it to application. Database queries can be expensive. So the way you do it in Rails, and again, there are similar techniques in other frameworks. You say Rails cache fetch, like this. What that will do is it will look in Redis, say, hey, does a record exist for this key? If it exists, it will return it to your application. If not, it will actually execute that quad code, query your primary database, do whatever other calculations you have to do, store the data in Redis with that appropriate key, and then return it to your application. So the first user who hits this code will pay a small performance penalty. Of, they all have to wait while it's generated. But the next users will get it much faster. And what I'm also doing here is I'm customizing my cache key. As I said in the first slide, it's object, ID, and timestamp. And I'm here adding the method name. And I like to do it as, my, as a pattern because I frequently have to cache multiple methods within the same class. So maybe I will also have total games played method that I want cached. And I want there to be distinct cache keys for one method versus the other. So when data is stored in Redis, it looks kind of like this. To Redis, it's just a string with a key and a TTL. So it's stored in database zero. Teams, that's the class, the team. One is the primary key. Then 2017, that's the timestamp. And the method name is at the end. And then team two has a different total points that is scored so far in these games. And it has a different TTL. And behind the scenes, there's a very basic Redis get, set, and expire command. Do you have a question? No. Oh, sorry. And guys, feel free to ask questions if you have any. Now, the big thing about caching is it's not cache generation. It's cache invalidation that can be a little hard. And I earlier just told you that the object cache key is derived from its timestamp. But we're not calculating team metrics. We're calculating the total scores, which are going to be stored in this scores table. So how can we appropriately update the team total points cache when, it's new, when a team scores a touchdown? Again, you could write some kind of an observer that will do it. Or what's the default way is you create a callback. Are people familiar with callbacks? As you're saving records, stuff happens magically. So in Rails, there's a way to do it. If a child record belongs to a parent, you say touch true. What that'll do is when a child is created, it'll touch the timestamp of the parent. And since parent has a new timestamp, it'll force the creation of a new cache key with a new content. And you don't have to define it for all the relationships. For example, here we have a game. And maybe for a game, which also may have a total points method, it's OK to show stale data. 
So you don't simply don't define it. The relationship, the timestamp will not change. And by the way, I have, uh, I'll post these slides online and there's all the technologies I'm mentioning. I will have links at the bottom of, at the end of my presentation. So don't worry about taking notes. Anyway, so like I said, so you don't have to define this touch through relationships on all. You have to look at your own business requirements and say, in this case, I, I need to regenerate my cash. I'm willing to pay the penalty. I'm willing to store the old key with the old timestamp, which is going to sit around and waste your RAM until TTL flushes it, and the new key, which is going to be used. So in Redis, it looks like this. Again, team one, team one, different timestamp, different TTL, different value. Redis doesn't care. It just says it's a key with some data in it. And when you run a doubt, just clear your cache. Again, just put that cache in a separate database so you can connect to Redis via command line and just flush it. And that'll sort of solve a lot of problems and then you figure out what the heck was going on. So let's shift gears a little bit. How many of you have been to a football game and were unpleasantly surprised by the weather? Okay, I can see we're not huge football fans here. <laughs> oh, not, obviously not Seattle. Are people from Seattle? Mostly, okay. Wow, not... Okay. Hey, it's refreshing to see people from Seattle who are not football fans. See? <laughs> All right, so anyway, so we want to enable our website visitors when they go to a website to look up their football scores, whatever, to look up weather so they can know how to dress for the game. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a simple form. People type their zip code, and then they wait while we query the third-party API. We fetch the JSON, and we display it for them. Not a hugely complex piece of code. And then more people come to our awesome website, and this querying process starts getting slow and expensive, because you're probably paying per use for that API access. So one way to solve it is you build a background job that every half an hour downloads data for all zip codes, processes those files, puts it into your primary database, and then your application talks to your primary DB. Not a huge undertaking, not so simple. Why not use caching? Here I build a simple class. I call it Weather API Client. I make a code to some API. I make a call to some API. I parse the data, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I simply cache it. Now I'm building a different cache key here. You can see I don't have an object like a user. I don't have its ID. I don't have its timestamp. But that's okay. I'm simply going to create a unique key based on a combination of the class, the method, and parameters. And I'm also going to override the TTL to be only 30 minutes versus the one hour that I defined as a default for my entire application. The data will be fetched on the first request. The first user will wait a little bit. The second user who's fetching the data for that zip code will get a faster experience, less load on the system, fewer charges to the third-party API. And in Redis, it looks like this. The keys, the key, the data is data. Redis does not care. And again, let's talk about something else. How many of you have been hit by DDS attacks? Really? Thought it'd be more. All right. How many of you, in general, enjoy grepping through your log files and finding those IP addresses and putting them into your firewalls? Yeah. No. Right. So how can we use caching to build a more intelligent throttling solution? So we use this library called Rack Attack, and Rack it's a Ruby middleware. What it does is it takes that IP address that comes into your system, it takes the current time, and it says, how many requests from the same IP in the time period does this configuration allow me to do? So I'm saying five minutes, 300 seconds, 300 requests. It takes the time and divides it by 300, and then it creates a counter based on that and the IP address combination. And every time a request comes in, it allows that create that key, again, combination of time and IP address, or increment it. So Redis has this awesome incur command, and it's just great for counting things. So in Redis, it looks like this. So the 4977 number, that's the timestamp divided by 300. And then there's IP address. And you notice they have different TTLs, because they just hit my system at different times. And this first IP hit me only 10 times, so this approach will allow it through. The second, the second record, it's already at 300. So the application will just block that IP, but only until this record expires, because in 232, 232 seconds, Redis will flush this key. 
And that, by the way, Redis TTL is not precise down to a second. It's a pr thing that runs within it. And from what I've seen, it's like 10 to 15 seconds accuracy. So it's great if you want to cache something for a week. I wouldn't trust it if you want to cache something for a minute. So this simple throttling will keep out most average users. But to keep out somebody more malicious or determined, we can implement the concept of exponential backoff, where we create multiple counters for different time periods for the same IP address. So here I have 60 minutes, 60 requests, and then 300 minutes, I'm sorry, 300 requests per 10 minutes. Here are the keys. Again, the 233, three, that is the timestamp derivative, time divided by 60, and 2916, that's time divided by 600, which is 10 minutes. Different expirations. Again, the, the expiration for a key is always the same as the time period of how long you want to limit that user for. So pretty straightforward. And really, really fast. And literally, we had an issue where somebody hit us, and we rolled out this solution. It was pretty simple to implement within like two hours. And it like on our database connection, we, we saw this kind of a spike. And then we saw this. So it didn't go way down to what it was before, but it kept out a lot of these people who are trying to do stuff to us. And you can take it even farther. And let's say you want to permanently block or allow somebody. And I like the idea of whitelisting people, because what if you have a customer with a lot of users behind the same IP address, and they are accessing your website for some reason, and you don't want to start throttling them? Alternatively, you can have a case where a particular IP is just hitting you too hard, and you want to just permanently ban it. And you could put this data in a config file and deploy it, and that works. Or you can use Redis to store these either safe list or block list IPs. And what Redis will do here is it'll just <coughs> check. And you can, instead of using Rails cache fetch, you could actually just use just basic Redis get command. On every request, it's going to check, hey, I'm, I'm getting a request for this IP. Does this IP exist in either safe, li safe list or block list? And the order of and you can define the order. Like first, it'll check your whitelist or safe list, then block list, and then it'll fall through to the throttling logic. And we just build a really simple UI so our internal users can add or remove these APs from this list. And what I actually did is I defined a TTL of seven days for these APs, so you don't leave them permanently in the system. You just like, hey, something's going on. Let's add this IP. Is it still a problem a week later? Okay. So this is, this is a string, but it's not, again, you don't keep a counter with these. You just check whether it exists or not. So what do you want to cache? Obviously, slow stuff. You want to look at like, how fast your pages load. You want to look at new relic. You want to look at your slow query log. You want to listen to your customers. And I'm not saying that caching is a Band-Aid solution you should apply to everything. I mean, you want to write decent code. You want to optimize your database indexes. But sometimes, caching will actually buy you time to implement a more complicated refactor on your system. So here's a screenshot from New Relic. We look at this data pretty frequently. You can see that there's some stuff that's slow. And we just drill in and look at that code, look at what can be cached. That's a pretty regular process for us. And the cool thing about New Relic, you don't actually have to sign up for their service. At least in Ruby, you can install their library locally. And then your dev environment, you can go to like slash New Relic. And it'll give you all kinds of interesting metrics. So that 13,000 milliseconds, that probably should be optimized. <laughs> what not to cache? Well, sometimes you want to keep data in your primary database. So you can write that select query. Or you, maybe you would just want to permanently, permanently store data. Or you have some kind of an archiving process where you're deleting the individual records and you're keeping the summary. Again, it really depends. But the big downside with caching is that here's your primary data. And here's a cache. So you can't like run a query that says, show me all users who have, show me all teams who have scored at least X points. Like it, you can't. Are there questions about caching? OK, well, let's move on. How many people have done background jobs and queues? OK, so the principle is that. There's tasks you want to do right away, like if a person is registering for your website or buying something on your website, you want to process that transaction, record it in your database, and then you want to maybe send them a receipt or a welcome email. And you don't want to make the user wait while your application is talking to that SMTP gateway. 
So you do that important stuff right away while the request is, pro is waiting, and then you queue a background process to do this secondary stuff. And some of the best practices of background jobs is you want to keep these small messages. So for example, if you're sending a newsletter to 1,000 people and you're going to queue, let's say, 1,000 jobs, you don't want to actually put all the user information into the queue. You want to instead put an ID of the user, and then when your job is being processed by your background process, it'll take the ID, query the database, get the email, get their name, et cetera, and then send it out. The reason for that is what if the data changes? I mean, sometimes you can queue up jobs that will take hours to process, and that's okay, or maybe not okay, but you still want to make sure that the data in the primary database always gets, gets used when the job actually executes. Or you may have to stop your background job, jobs from running and restart it an hour later. You also want your jobs to be item potent, which is a really fancy word of saying you can do the same thing over and over, but without negative side effects. For example, if a user cancels their account, you put their your update user status equals inactive. You can do that many times. But if you're refunding money, you probably don't want to do it multiple times. And last, you want to keep your jobs concurrent. So you have this queue, and you want to have multiple workers working against this queue, writing lots and lots of jobs in parallel, because that will allow you to scale your system if needed, or when needed. So here's a basic flow, and I'm going to talk about a library called Sidekick, which is a common Ruby gem. You have a user interacting with the application. The application then throws stuff into Redis. And then Sidekick background process here picks it up off the queue in Redis, does something with it, and you can actually push the information back to the user so you display a message, your report has been processed, something like that. You have a concept of a server, which is a background process that's running on your computer, and you also have a concept of a client that lives within your application, and that's what application uses to push jobs into the queue. And you configure them here and specify Redis connection string, namespace. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I like to put my jobs and other data in, I store in Redis into a different database than the one I use for caching. So I specify database one. And also some people actually like to set up dedicated Redis servers. So one would be used for caching and one would be used for background jobs and other data storage. The reason for that is when you start reaching the limits of your Redis RAM, again, Redis stores everything in RAM. You run out of RAM, problems. And uh, it will actually define, it, it can actually be configured to purge. And that's okay to purge cache, like least recently used type cache, but you don't want Redis to start purging your jobs and other data. So that's the reason for having two separate Redis servers, not just databases. So here's the Sidekick UI. You can see that, for example, we run almost 14 million jobs when I took this screenshot a few weeks ago. And you can see on this chart, that's 2 million. So on that day over there, we ran almost 4 million jobs. And I assure you there was a legitimate reason for that. But it's kind of hard to tell. Normally, we run about 40 to 50,000 jobs a day, and we do all kinds of things, sending email, importing records, generating reports to these jobs. We have probably 30 or 40 different jobs, multiple queues, multiple background processes running on each server. So it's really been a huge benefit to our scalability. And behind this UI, there's actually an API you can use in this library, and you can build your own monitoring tool using this API. Alternatively, you could talk to Redis data structures directly, extract the data, and send you appropriate alerts. For example, if you have 100 jobs backed up in a queue, well, that might be okay, but if they've been sitting in that queue for two weeks, that's probably a problem. Or maybe you have like a really important high-priority queue that you never want to have more than 10 jobs backed up there. So you can build a lot of logic based on the type of a job, the queue that it's running, you know, how long it's been processing, how many times it aired out, all kinds of things. Or at least you can just visually inspect this and you can give access to this to your business users and tell them not to screw things up. <laughs> because this UI actually allows you to do a lot of powerful stuff and then they can do some basic troubleshooting. So like right now, for example, you can see that there was 34 jobs, jobs in queue and there were nine sidekick workers running. So when Sidekick uses da stores data in Redis, it uses pretty much all of their Redis's data structures. It uses its queues that uses sets. So again, set is basically a combination of unique elements. It uses jobs. To it uses lists to store jobs. So it's a very actually efficient operation. It's always O1 to throw something onto a list. That's why queuing jobs 
with this approach is just so cheap. It also uses sorted sets. Are people familiar with sorted sets? You have a member and with score, which gives it a rank. And it uses sorted sets for scheduling jobs to run maybe in an hour or in a month. And also all those statistics that you saw earlier, they're stored in hashes in Redis. And you can store multiple, you can create multiple hashes with different granularity of statistics and then expire them in different intervals. So you probably don't care how your jobs that around five years ago have performed, but you probably want to see, you probably want to know how many total jobs are around there, right? Versus for last week, you want to see more detailed stats. So basic Redis commands behind all this magic are sed, which is set ed. So that's, I'm creating a queues set. Can people see that? Okay. And then once I create this set with the list of my queues, I use L push, which is list push command, to add this JSON encoded payload to that queue. And that's all the client has to do. The server that goes through a similar process where it checks each queue that it's configured to watch, grabs the messages, decode, you know, I'm sorry, in processes, it uses the JSON to do what it's supposed to. So here are a couple of examples where we applied it. As I mentioned, my day job is at a fundraising platform, and our customers are large universities who use the system to send out very massive newsletters, 100,000 recipients, basically asking people for money. And then, then SendGrid sends us webhooks notifying us when those emails were opened or clicked. So it's great because we get re near real-time reporting to our customers. The problem is that when they send out one of these very large newsletters to 100,000 people, our system gets flooded with a whole bunch of inbound requests, sending us the data with like a unique message ID and open and click. And we build our code to basically have a controller which takes this payload and parses it, passes it to a class which will query the database and appropriately increment our statistics. So we experienced this huge influx in requests which caused our worker processes on a web service to spike and then caused our database connections to spike. So to solve it, we simply put a job between the controller and the class. So controller just enqueues the job, and then the, the background process chugs through them. And you can actually see it get queued up in that UI that we'll see like a few thousand jobs get queued up, and a few minutes later, they're all processed. And this, I think, is a very good pattern towards situations where you may receive a huge influx of messages, but you don't care if they get processed right away or in near real time. The alternative is you have to build your system to be able to scale to this, whatever this peak level is, when in reality, most of the time, we are operating at much lower scale. Another area you can use this for is for model callbacks. So you have a record you're saving, like let's say a score, a team scored, and let's say we want to generate some kind of a report or maybe update that cache so the first user doesn't have to pay a penalty waiting. So we could actually call this method directly in our after save, but that will slow down the process of saving our primary record. And all we do is we just queue up a background job, we pass appropriate parameters, it has negligible effect on the, that, up, that save operation, and the data gets processed in near real time. So in this case, it'll force regenerate the cache so the total points is updated, as, well, as I've shown you in the previous slides about caching. And you can actually combine these approaches take, to take this approach to the next level and really implement a cache pre-generation system. And it gets a little bit more complex because you have to really ask yourself some hard questions like how often does this data change and how expensive is it going to be for me to calculate it on demand versus how long my users will have to wait for the page load what I generated on request. And you also don't want to, you want to be careful on how you define the TTL process because Again, if you're just constantly regenerating the same data that has expired, then you're wasting CPU cycles. But if you are keeping the, this TTL, setting it too long, then you're going to be keeping multiple cache keys with you know, the current one and multiple previous cached contents until it's purged with TTL. So it's a more complex area, and you just have to look at what your unique needs are, what your customer requirements are, how much money you have, how much time, so on. And one thing you want to avoid with these frequently running jobs like this, you want to avoid overlapping jobs or like iteration overrun. You don't want the previous caching process to run while you are starting a new one. Yeah. 
don't want overlapping jumps. Okay, so here's one way to do it. So here's a really simple pre-generating cache job. You basically loop through all the teams and you call this total points method. And it's a very sequential way to do it, but it's simple. And one thing it does is that right here, what I'm doing is I'm doing a check. Hey, is there a flag in Redis? And I'm using simply a class name as that unique flag. And think of it as a process ID, PID file, right? One process writes it on your server, the other one check if it exists, and if it doesn't, it will not do what it's supposed to, because you only want one thing to run at a time. So I'm using Redis here, and I'm just talking to it directly using this Redis connection client. And uh, if, there, if, there's another, if there's a key exists with, in this case, class name, it will stop. This job will not execute. On the other hand, if this key doesn't exist, the very first thing it'll do is it'll set a key with, it, with this name in Redis, then it'll execute, and then it'll clean up after itself. And I'm doing something extra here as I'm setting this expiration right here to 15 minutes. And the reason for that is, what if something fails here? Then this line of code will never get executed, and the next job will come along, and it'll see that the key already exists, because it was now probably, properly cleaned up, and it will never run until you go in and you manually clean up this data. And in this day, the system will return to a reasonably normal state in 15 minutes. So it's just a precaution. Now, another way to do this is in parallel. As I talked earlier, you want concurrent processes. To do that, we can have one job queue up other jobs. Again, this is just object-oriented programming, right? So you run this pre-generate job, and it calls this update cache job. So this will run 33 jobs, right? The first one, and then 32 jobs for each team. It's going to execute much faster. It also introduces a concept of different queues. So the first one I'm running through high priority queue. And uh, these ones I'm running through a low priority queue because maybe I don't care that they get backed up a little bit. Let's talk about different queues. You don't want to have one queue in your system. Because you may have a situation where you have like 10,000 jobs that are fairly low priority, not time sensitive, and then you get like 20 jobs that are really urgent, except you have to first process the first 10,000 before you begin working on these 20. So you want to define a few queues, but not too many, like three or four is a good place to start. It's like high, default, and low. So perhaps high queue is something like report generation, so you can send it to users right away. Default queue could be sending emails. And low queue could be processing some of these webhook notifications, or perhaps you're importing data from somewhere, and you can have, we literally have 100,000 jobs of importing records because each job is one separate record. And we just queue up 100,000 jobs in our low priority queue, and we don't care that it take, may take a few hours to process as long as our emails go out through the default queue, or as long as the other high priority tasks execute through the high priority queue. And the way you configure it, you can actually, this is configuration for Sidekick, but you can set it up so it, the process will watch different queues in different priority order. So here it'll watch default queue and then low priority queue. So if you have 100,000 jobs in a low priority queue and then a default task is scheduled to execute, it'll run it and then it'll get back to the low priority tasks. And here I'm actually configured one worker to run nothing but the high priority queues. So just play around. Here's some basic configuration that I think helped us just fine-tune some of the knobs. And just queue things up. Just stay calm. You also need to, yes? Uh, why more queues instead of a, like an ordered queue? You could do it. It's just kind of simpler to have just different queues. And then theoretically, there's a limit with a Redis of, I think, 2 billion items per list. So I don't think, I personally have never hit that. But it's just kind of simpler to have I mean, you, you could try to weigh things, weigh things within a queue, but it's just easier. Any other questions? Yeah. Are you using like, channels or different databases for your queues? No, so, so I'm not using the pub sub for queuing here in Redis. It's just list. So L push, and the, the worker picks it up. Following up, can you compare contrast using Redis versus like RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ? I've played around a little bit with RabbitMQ. Again, I think there's some just more interesting data structures it supports. I'm not an expert on it at all. And I've heard, again, I've heard very good things about the technology. Uh, there are some hosted services that actually were hosted for you. I've done some simple stuff with like SQS also with Amazon, 
what I like about Redis is it's I'm already using Redis for caching. I'm already using Redis for queuing. I'm using it for other things. So it's kind of a Swiss Army knife roll of duct tape combination mm -hmm. versus if I were to use Memcache for caching or RabbitMQ for queuing or something else. It's just, yeah, I'm, I'm sure at a certain scale you might look at it and say, well, we need something more powerful than Redis. If you need to have more than 2 billion messages queued up at any given time, Redis will not do it in a single queue. So, any other questions? Okay. So like I said, you want to put some intelligent monitoring using either that API or some other functionality and just be alerted when the message has been sitting for too long or too many messages. Or perhaps you want to configure things that it's okay to retry some stuff, like sending an email, but refunding money and you error out, maybe you don't want to retry that. Okay, where's my laptop? What the hell? Okay, well, this is really interesting. My laptop decided to freeze. I might have to talk from memory, which is kind of painful. <coughs> oh. Oh, good. <laughs> Storing. What the? Okay, we might have to. <laughs> wow. Thank you for being so kind. So far, I'm sure you'll start bringing out the pitchforks pretty soon. I have no idea what's going on. The cursor's still showing. <coughs> so it's still on because the cursor's on. No, I know it's on, but it's just. OK, how about if I reboot and I talk a little bit from memory or take some questions? It's, it's been a pretty good laptop, and I put Linux on it. I got rid of Windows, actually, on it. It was a big step for me. I started my career at Microsoft on Windows Team, so this is a for the. While I've used Red, Linux as a primary OS for probably 10 plus years, I've never actually had a situation where I didn't have a computer that I could boot Windows on until a few weeks ago. And obviously, it's having issues. Any questions about caching or background jobs so far? Okay, so the next topic I'm going to talk about is the idea of using Redis as a database. So I remember that. Demo I showed earlier, it was an NFL leaderboard site. So what you saw there is that teams are moving up and down, right? If a team scores, its total points calculation, aka leaderboard score, increases. And uh, also, other teams may score than the team moving up or down. So here's my good friend Chris over there, and he and I may be competing against each other. And I have 100 points, excuse me, and Chris has 120. So he's number one, I'm number two. Then I get five more points, that changes my score, but doesn't change my rank. Versus if I get 150 points total, then I move ahead of him. And that's the basics of the leaderboards. You have mem unique members, again, just like in any set, and your score defines your rank. And you can query a sorted set, and you easily get data already returned to you and ordered by that rank. And what I also did in my website, I didn't show it to you, is I created this whole this concept of mapping of teams to leaderboards. So actually, many to many. So a team can be competing against as many other teams in as many different competitions. And we actually used it as in real world. We ran this big fundraiser for Notre Dame University. So they had 900 fundraisers. Not kidding. And they had, each team was in at least, each, each, each fundraiser, like a chess club or a debate team or whatever they had which is at least two leaderboards. So this is like a lot of data. And with Redis, we were able to serve it in like near real time. It would take fractions of a second to regenerate all this data. Okay. Let's hope it works better this time. You guys can see it. Excellent. Let's skip through the, so these slides. Did I miss anything? Uh huh. There, leaderboard. So as I said, we have this leaderboard group, many to many relationship to teams. So sorted sets I use to store the ranking and the scores. Separately, we want to store additional data about these members. We don't want to show their unique ID on our page. We want to show their team name. We want to show their logo, their hometown, whatever. Right? You could query Redis for the scoring ranking information, and then query your primary database for the additional metadata. Or you can use Redis hashes to store it. So when you're extracting out of Redis, it takes a combination of sorted set data, then it queries the hashes and merges data. So you are UI, what you saw, I can, I can, do you guys want to see that leaderboard again? Or no? Okay. Sure. 
Okay. Uh, so. I was very proud. Hey, I'm not a UI guy, and I built some you know, nice JavaScript there. It auto refresh, very smooth transitions. So, kick off a background process. Some charts and graphs. See, little nice arrows. And so that's the main one, and you can see it auto refreshes every two seconds. And then I have these separate leaderboards, one, one for each division. So, total of nine. Anyway, so back to this. So, like I said, take the data from a sorted set, which gives you the rank and score, combine it with the data that comes from the hash, and return. Here's what it looks like in uh, Redis, and here's what the hashes look like in Redis. So again, this is a key value pairs of, I'm using slugs for my unique IDs because they're more visually interesting, but in reality, you probably want to use the primary key because if a team name changes, you're going to be in a bit of a trouble trying to appropriately update the stats. So when it comes out of the leaderboard, it looks like this. When it comes out of my API backhand, this is what it gets consumed by the JavaScript app. Okay. We build a couple of simple classes. One is called leaderboard set to write the data. <coughs> Basically, you pass it the score, and from that score, this class determines who the team is, aka member, and what is the leaderboard score, which is the total points that the team has scored. Sorry, slight overuse of the word score. And then what it'll do is it'll say, oh, and how many competitions, aka leaderboards, this team is competing. Let me loop through all of those. Let me make multiple API calls appropriately incrementing the rank and the, or the score of each team in each leaderboard. Because your score is going to be the same across leaderboards, but your rank may be different. And to extract data, just a basic leaderboard get. You pass it the unique leaderboard ID. It gets the data. And behind the scenes is a really basic Redis Z score, Z rank, Z card, H get commands. And there are questions about storing data in Redis. Yes? So how much how much memory would you set aside for something? Again, depending on your application. Well, so even with like I said, nine hundred fundraisers and actually we have multiple other customers who have like fifty or hundred fundraisers. This is taking up, I don't know, a few megs. Again, we're using a shared database for caching and for background jobs and for this data storage and for other things. And I think the most we had is like 500 megs. Yeah, so it's pretty cheap. I mean, we're paying 80 bucks a month to AWS for one and a half gig Redis instance, and that's for redundant. So we're paying for two. So just, I wouldn't worry about it. This is not like a primary database with, you know, millions and millions of users. If you got to push that much data, then you might have issues. <laughs> okay. So now let's talk about synchronizing data. So we have this problem, but we often have multiple databases, right? We have OLAPDB for our reporting and OLTP for transaction processing. Not, not just with Redis, just you can have two MySQL databases. And you might have data flow one directionally or two directionally. How do you keep it all in sync? <laughs> so the most common reason we'd want to update the data on a Redis leaderboard is that when a team scores, and again, here I just create a simple callback. Then when a score is created, I call that leaderboard set class. And it creates a very near real time, like fractions of a second update. Because alternative would be to run like some kind of a process every five minutes or every hour, and that doesn't work very well. People are not nearly as patient as they used to be. But if you have a data flowing differently, different direction from Redis to your primary DB, that can also be an interesting use case. So, Let's talk about that total points method. When we first started, we were just querying our primary DB, doing all the summing, and then we wrapped it in caching, so it was a little bit faster, actually a lot faster, but still, the data had to be persisted in primary database first, and then it could be extracted and cached in Redis for a period of time. Well, what if we could use Redis as a counter? So every time a team scores, we can create a counter on a team, some kind of a total points counter, this is separate from actually recording the score, but instead of caching the data, we just use this temporary counter. And when the games are over, then we could move the data from the total point, this temporary counter, into the primary database and persist it. And that could be used for something like, let's say, TV show, American Idol, right? You're gonna have a million votes in a minute for different performers. And you probably don't want to do a million writes to your MySQL database, even if it's a simple increment. What you could do is you can create this right as counter, keep incrementing the data there, and when everything is done, you would just simply move that snapshot performing just a few writes to your primary ADB. 
So here's one way to do it. So I'm going to create this again using the similar callback and the score model. I'm calling total points increment and passing it the score points, which basically, you know, three for a field goal, six for a touchdown. And this red is total points increment. So what I did is use the library called Redis objects. But all it does, it creates get and set methods on your model. Just like creating a field name, we'll have a get and set ability for name, except your name is going to be persisted in MySQL. Well, this data will be persisted in Redis. So the same team model, and this class will just automatically figure out, that, oh, to extract a right name or description, I go to MySQL or Mongo. But to appropriately update this Redis total points, which is it says counter, I'm going to go to Redis. And calling Redis total points incur, and again, it's a special thing for a counter, just increments a counter. And then I also created a field called permanent total points, which is where the data will be stored in the primary DB after the games are all over. And I modified my total points method to simply, instead of doing all this caching or querying, I get it either from this temporary buffer counter or I get it from in the primary database. And this is completely abstracted from other parts of my applications. They just, my UI code just calls team.totalPoints. It doesn't care. Data in Redis looks kind of like this. I modified a little bit to use the slug again as my unique Redis key combination. But you, again, in real world, you probably want to use the primary key ID. And this is not caching. So you can see the TTL there is set to negative one, which means Redis will persist the data until I either manually delete it or do something else with it. So instead of going to a primary database and then getting summed up in caching, it's now being stored in Redis until then I choose to move it to the primary DB. Or I can leave it in Redis if I want to. It's kind of like a temporary storage for your stuff before you move it somewhere else. Uh, there are questions about synchronizing data. OK. Well, here are the, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just let AWS do that for me. I click a couple of check boxes. But yes, I've played around with it on my own and decided it was just way too much pain to deal in reality. And I just don't want the responsibility and $40 a month extra of my employer's money is not worth it. <laughs> but yes, that, that's a cop out answer. But yes, I've, I've played around with Redis replication. It's pretty simple. You just could, much simpler than my SQL configuration <laughs> for replication. Any other questions? Yes? So what I actually did is I built this other class to what's called a leaderboard reset. And I actually had a slide in it, but I cut it out. But it's very much designed for a situation where something changed. Like, for example, let's say team name changes. Or now, like, we had some issues with our schools changing their fundraiser structure. So basically what a leaderboard reset process does is it goes to all the data in a primary database, which is the kind of like source of truth. And then says, OK, you on this leaderboard, you on this leaderboard, let me appropriately refresh. And let me delete all the data in, lead in leaderboards stored in Redis and those sorted sets and in hashes. And let me appropriately update them all. So it's kind of like this takes about a minute for even the biggest ones and just kind of like resets it. But yes, I've thought about that. And this was also useful in, like, in testing. Let's say you have a test server and you take your primary DB from production, you restore it on your test server. And then you're like, oh, but how do we get this leaderboard? Because we got to push the data into Redis. So you just run this refresh reset process pretty quick. Question? Anybody else? OK, well, I still have a few Redis stickers here if anybody wants those. Uh, if anybody wants promo code for the Redis Conf in San Francisco, talk to me. Here are all the libraries that I mentioned. There's an interesting video on Confreaks. There's an interesting website about queues. Thank you very much. Just use Redis wisely. You know, it's a powerful tool. Don't shoot yourself in the foot.